and screamed like a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I was on sale, the Steam sale for Halloween. So I got the Michael Myers expansion for it right away. Oh, is it out on Steam? Yeah, it's been out for a while, but the, oh. the Michael Myers uh, DLC came out on like the 25th. I might have to check that out, those damn Steam sales. Yeah, it's uh, 20 bucks will get you the game and um, the DLC. Yeah. Oh, nice. And then there's a, a free DLC that come with it, too. Are you familiar with that game at all? I've heard of it. Uh, I haven't like looked too much into it at all. I heard it was really good, though. Yeah, it's um, 4v1, four survivors against one killer. Mm-hmm. And then... You can either play the killer or one of the survivors, right? Yeah, and the, the survivors have to start generators, and then when all five generators are started, then you like flip a switch, open a door, and get out. But it gets it gets pretty intense because like you'll be <laughs> sitting there trying to start a generator, and then you hear the heartbeat. Of the, the faster sure. the heartbeat, the closer the guy gets, and you'll see him like pop up, and you take everyone. And there's a screaming involved, and yeah, it's <laughs> the gist of me playing it. I'm really bad at it too, so it's really complicated to pay, play that kind of game. And masturbate at the same time. <laughs> now my secret is out. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying it. it's a challenge. Well, I usually get killed before I can finish, and yeah. I'm trying to line the two up. That's the only thing that you can do before you finish. I can't do one without the other. Oh boy! Funny story before we start recording this. My um, <laughs> we are live on air though. Yes, I know. I know. It's it's nothing that I wouldn't put in the show. I'm just not gonna record this and put it in there. But uh, <laughs> I have a cousin that I have not really spoken with in probably 20 plus years. And when my grandpa died, I saw her there obviously and, and friended her on Facebook shortly thereafter because I always enjoyed hanging out with her. And uh, <clears throat> I posted that picture of the machete, the Kane Hodder machete, and she asked about the podcast. And I'm like, all right, here you go. But I am pretty vulgar and she's like oh i downloaded the, the gremlins and, and critters episode and i'm like just waiting to hear what she says so we're talking about me jerking off and dying in a video game <laughs> like, she won't watch the videos but i'm like how big of a surprise would that be it's the last time i saw her, i was probably like nine or ten years old <laughs> it's like i can't come without dying in a video game <laughs> my mom listened to a couple of the early oh. Elite, uh, oh, d20 geez. podcasts <laughs> Oh. And uh, there were mentions of my teenage years and, and mentions of my mom and stuff. And she's like, yeah, I don't remember that exactly. And it's just, but yeah, it, <laughs> the podcasts are who we are. You know, I, oh, I yeah, feel yeah. like oh, yeah. the people who know us kind of have to realize by now this is, this is it. Oh, they get an idea know. pretty quick otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we don't try away. Although, depending on who the guest is, is how like bad it gets, how quick, how quickly it gets. Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks, Mark. You're welcome. The show hasn't even started <laughs> recording, and we're already in. Show. I'm here, and we're already in masturbation territory. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I like to call it. Up. I like to call it bait mode, but <laughs> <laughs> bait mode. <laughs> All right, we should probably get this shit show rolling so we can watch the game in case this takes two and a half hours. Oh, shit. <laughs> Probably like got things in order before I... Is that why we're doing this at 11 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> because so, of the game. so we can watch a uh, Packer game? I never wrote a, an intro for Mark. No, that's that's okay. I don't need no intro. Oh, fine. You can talk about yourself then when we get there. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start doing this now. Welcome to episode 63 of the Podcast of Terror, a production of the Galactic Network. This is a podcast about all things scary. I'm your host, Matt Stein. With me, as always, is Corey. Quote, unquote, I wear shorts while I podcast, Scott. I, I figured I would dress up for you and make myself look pretty. I just, I just want you to like me. Well, I like how you dress up from the waist down, the, the part of you I can't even see. Yeah, well, I mean, if you saw it, you would just feel really bad about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Corey Baby Arm Scott. That's, I think that's your name. Uh, for more on this podcast, including show notes, contact information, subscription links, you can go to gncast.com slash pot. You can chat with us on our Slack channel during our shows over at gncasts.com slash sign up. And while you're there, you can subscribe to our newsletter as well. 
We are spoiler heavy. We're going to be talking about the serpent and the rainbow a little later. So if you haven't seen that, go ahead and watch it now. Uh, and I swear. I swear too. Okay, we all swear. I, I'll swear too. So. Ooh, that elusive baritone voice you just heard is our guest, <laughs> Mark Krontrak, who's returning. He wouldn't let me write a uh, intro for him because A, I forgot. And B, I remembered right when we were about to start recording. So Mark, why don't you tell the nice people what you do? I do movie reviews uh, for WeLiveEntertainment.com, for my own channel, uh, Special Mark Productions on YouTube, and even for uh, Galactic Netcast Radio, I do the one-minute uh, movie reviews there. Uh, so I do a lot of movie reviews written. I also do a podcast called The Spoiler Room, which obviously deals with movies. So uh, I spin a lot of plates, but uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on again. Wow, oh, I'm happy to have you back here. Uh... You're way better at movies than Corey and I. <laughs> so you really bring up like the classiness of this podcast. <laughs> I, I really have been enjoying your spots on Galactic Radio, though. I think Galactic Radio has come together so well um, because it's made up of all these different people and bring something different to it. But it just it works great in this kind of like one stop show for everything. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun listening to that. I think I'm supposed oh. to be on that soon. <laughs> You Glad are. You, you just were. Oh, I just was. Okay. <laughs> Dave never told me when it was coming out. So, hey, he I was to, just on Galactic Radio. <laughs> he likes to keep you on your toes. Eh, well, he may you. have told me, and I just missed it. I've kind of been in a weird haze the past couple of weeks. But hey, this is not the place to talk about that. It's, it's not really, legal there yet. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, have either of you been watching the new season of uh, Black Mirror? No. I oh. Have you ever watched the show at all? No, I have not. Damn it, Mark. No, same here. Get your <laughs> shit together. <laughs> so, I know. The, the third yeah. season's on Netflix, but it's like the easiest way to describe it is like the Twilight Zone, but technology now. Nice. So, so like there's this one episode that I just watched, and I'm going to totally ruin it, but that's what we do here. Um, it shows like this kid and his, his sister steals his laptop, and she gets like a virus on it. And then you, you kind of get a glimpse that someone's watching him through the camera on his computer. And he's like babysitting his sister or something, and he gets the the teenage itch, and he goes <laughs> in his room and locks his computer or locks his door, and you just you see what be is the beginning of him getting into bait mode, <laughs> and then all of a sudden he gets an email and it's like, hey, we saw what you did, send your phone number, we're gonna send the video to everyone in your contacts, and it's like this, you know, do this, be here at this time to do this thing, and it's this long string, and you see like all these people involved and. They're like, as long as you do what we tell you to do, we won't release the video. And then ultimately at the end, they release everyone's, what they have on everyone. And it shows it just going through like person by person, but it turns out like the kid was jerking off to kitty porn. No. Oh. Yeah, but you don't, you don't really understand that until like right. later on. But, oh God, it was, it was a really good. It's a really good show. It's a great show. I, like, I recommend it. I feel like at any point in time, anybody could receive a random text saying, I saw what you did or I know what you did. And it doesn't matter if actually anybody saw anything, is that we would all react with like, oh, shit, because <laughs> we all have something. Oh, we yeah. All, we all, yeah. Like, we fall right in the trap like, well, fucking A, I knew it was going to happen eventually. <laughs> yeah. If all of a sudden I tell you that I can no longer podcast because I've started my computer on fire, you know I got one of those messages. <laughs> <laughs> it just burnt the whole fucker down. Did you watch Mr. Robot? Yeah. The first season. So in the first season, there is the scene where uh, Elliot, the main character, gets all paranoid and goes through the ritual of destroying all the information that's yep. on his devices, everything with the microwave and all that. And it's, it's pretty classic. It's, it's standard fare yeah. um, if, you, if you've ever done anything with, uh, with hacking. But it's still it's cool to see the representation up on screen and to see that it happens completely from a paranoia standpoint not even like this is necessary um, because that's that's kind of par for the course with that kind of yeah the current mindset season of south park is all about internet trolling and um stan's dad goes through <laughs> i can't remember what he calls it but he has he like drills holes through all of his hard drives and gets rid of his computer because someone's like i know who you are and it turns out it's just the other trolls that wanted to be his friend he's like, the fuck <laughs> did you do that <laughs> That's not what we're here about, though. Like, we could start a South Park cast. Pod Park. I would have to imagine one of those exists already. South cast? I'm sure there's a dozen of them that exist. I mean, if we did it, we would just be being derivative of the Simpsons podcast, worst episode ever, because that's what guys. South Park is. <laughs> that's true. 
Those guys are dicks. They made fun of us, Corey. They made fun of us well, though. No, they didn't. Don't give them the satisfaction of knowing that we enjoyed it. <laughs> Better than we <laughs> Yeah. Fucking pricks. And I, apparently, uh, Dan actually listens to this, so he will hear in all of his glory that I called him a fucking prick. Finally. <laughs> love you. And that's how you know that we're in love. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, uh, let's talk about some news here. Uh, the first story we got is the Candyman director wants to make a proper sequel to the original film. I've seen the first one. I have not seen any of the sequels, but I assume it's much like the majority of the early 90s, late 80s slasher style movies where there's like 12 of them there were three yep oh yeah there were only three um but But the the thing is that the second one and the third one don't continue the story from the first one they include the the main character of of Candyman, uh Mm -hmm. played by tony todd but in the first one uh he corrupts uh virginia madsen's character and basically turns her into something like himself. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen Candyman. And they never followed up with that storyline in the other movies. So that's what uh, the original uh, maker of the movie is trying to do now. They could still get Tony Todd to play it too, because uh, if you've seen him in any of the indie horror that he's been, he could still pull off Candyman, I think, really well. Oh, yeah. Because he's barely showing any age i mean you look yeah. at him he looks almost exactly the same as he did when he first made candy man so you know if they got him i'd be in if they got him to play candy man because i like tony todd in general though so would you yeah. not see it if they didn't get tony todd or would you just be reluctant well, I, to go see it because i've seen some of the movies you go see i I'd, I'd go see it anyway because i'm a, a, a movie addict and so i would watch it but I think it'd be more acceptable if they had him in the main role, mm-hmm. you know, and actually well, the, be throughout the film rather than make an appearance for three minutes and then he's gone. <laughs> the good news is that uh, Bernard Rose is saying that he'd not only like to get Todd back, but he wants to get Virginia Madsen back as well. And Virginia Madsen, uh, I've had a deep crush on since Electric Dreams uh-huh. in, the, in the early 80s. Uh, Bud Court is the voice of the computer. Awesome movie. Uh, but she is now on that Kiefer Sutherland show, Lone Survivor or something mm-hmm. presidential yeah. dude. And uh, she looks great. She oh, looks designated absolutely fantastic. Survivor. Designated Survivor. Thank yeah. you. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, getting her back to this again would be really terrific too because she was, she was an integral part of that first movie. Uh, she has continued to act and has done a lot of She's done a lot of horror stuff as well, but she's just been in so many things, and I think that she's a terrific actress, and it would be nice to get the, the whole group back together for if for doing a continuation of a movie from 1992, though. I mean, we're talking about it's 25 years later, mm-hmm. practically, and they're just talking about, oh, it'd be great to do this, but that's not cool. always do 25-year-later movies come out <laughs> and, and well, work out. Dumb in the dumber. eight. In the age, yeah, in the age oh. of crowdfunding and Indiegogo, though, if if uh, Bernard Rose would be able to try to raise the funds to buy the rights to it, because they haven't done anything with the license for whatever many years of mm. Candyman, you know, he probably could get the funding. I, I wouldn't doubt if they would be willing to part for it, and you don't see him doing anything with it, so yeah. Uh, and I never see it on cable. I see no. the sequels pop up all the time. I think it's uh, Farewell of the Flesh might be the one that shows up a lot on TV. Yeah, I think But I haven't seen the original Candyman in so long, and it's not because I wouldn't watch it. It's just because it hasn't been there. It's not something that's easy to get to. So mm. at the very least, it's about time that they should do a re-release of it to Blu-ray and, and have that out and then maybe have cable channels start playing it again. But it... Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to see it. It, it. It's weird. It came out at a point in time where it reminded me enough of Hellraiser type movies and stuff just to look at it externally. And it was exciting and, and new and a little bit different. It's weird that it didn't take off more than what it did. It's got a huge cult following, though. I mean, it, almost any horror fan, you talk to them about Candyman. Oh, yeah, that's great. You know, but... Mm-hmm. but uh yeah, I mean, I, I, I dug the original Candyman, and it was on the tail end of the slasher hype. 
Um, but it was different, like you said, that that kept it fresh because um, the slashers were on their way out on the late '80s, early '90s, until uh, Wes, you know, reinvented it again. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of in that in between time when horror fans, I think, were looking for something new. And there's Candyman, and you're like, oh, sweet. And then Tony Todd is just scary as hell. So <laughs> that's yeah. true. It might be really expensive to do now because you know we have a shortage of bees. Yeah, I know a well, guy. They'd <laughs> just be CGI bees. That's true. And maybe that, I don't know. Maybe that would suck. I think uh, sometimes when they make these movies and they use too much CGI, it's not even. Yeah, you know, it loses you want something. Them to stand side by side, at the very least, you want to be able to look at the original and look at the new one and have them have the same kind of visual aspect and cues to to be able to watch a series and not feel like oh, and then this is where everything's changed and we've yeah. all gone to bullshit Hollywood effects. Which is not what CGI naturally is, but mm -hmm. when it's overused, it really stands out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the new uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> just, just, and it, it, was, it was better than the first, but... Yeah, the, the sequel, I, I watched the sequel and I did not despise it in the way that I thought I was going to. Yeah, uh, but, but I didn't watch the you, first one. When you see CGI turtles fighting a CGI Bebop and Rocksteady on a CGI Techno drone, it's like yeah. it. It could have they could have very well just did it as a CGI cartoon. Yes, in all yeah. honesty. Yes, uh, and that's the way I took the second one. And I, yeah, you're right. I I enjoyed that one a lot more. Maybe because uh, Megan Fox had very little screen time. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's what helped. I know one person that listens to this that's going to be upset if we make fun of Megan, Megan Fox. <laughs> so let me just point out that she's not that attractive and has toe thumbs. <laughs> Sorry, Martin. Placated. Uh, <laughs> I, I have nothing against Megan Fox at all. She, no. she, she was not the worst thing in that movie. She wasn't the best thing in that movie. But uh, unfortunately, the, the turtles weren't enough to overrun what the movie was. Right. No, it, <clears throat> I felt like that with the... The Hobbit films is that it got to a point where they were doing big scenes of well we've got the CGI to do this so let's do this as opposed to actually telling story and it just it starts to become ridiculous and you lose any kind of connection with the characters and with the plot and you're just like watching stuff bump into each other mm -hmm. uh, the Hobbit films were just toss off films <laughs> I, I, they could have probably oh, Matt, we're gonna lose them for the next 10 minutes they could have they could have made two really good films out of those three hobbit films but um, yeah I mean, <laughs> maybe we digress we digress let's talk about more blood and stuff yes uh, blood. the walking dead squeezes george a romero out of the zombie genre i haven't read this story yet Corey. you put the stuff in here about 10 minutes before we started so <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's that nice to do this work for the show and get so much credit <laughs> for it. Um, hey, I, I'm really happy that you do it. I'm not <laughs> saying I'm not. I just didn't get a chance to read this before I'm supposed to start talking about it. So I'm hoping you read it and you can talk about it while I no, read I it. Just, I just went off the title. Uh, no, what oh. George Romero basically is saying is that in, uh, in 2007, he did Diary of the Dead and mm -hmm. uh, it made money. He did Land of the Dead, which was the biggest zombie film he had ever made. But right now, if he wants to make just a simple zombie film, much in the, the way that he did uh, Dawn of the Dead or Day of, Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Living Dead, those sorts of things, he can't do it anymore because the first thing out of people's mouths is, well, Brad Pitt paid $400 million to make a zombie movie, so we need this giant, spectacular zombie film now. Uh, or we need some, or zombies, like all the, the intricate stuff, the, the storytelling stuff is being done on the TV series, so it, it needs to be a spectacle, uh, or why would we do it? Yeah. And that's that's too bad. Mm-hmm. That's that's sad too, because that that Brad Pitt zombie film was was not good. Not good enough to get a sequel. It, it, which I thought it was getting a sequel. That's it, what I mean. Yeah, it's not yeah. good, but, but it's, it's not good oh, enough. Oh, okay. Well, no, because everybody went to it, but when I watched it, you know, you in your zombie film that was trying to take itself too seriously in that one, you don't want your audience laughing. And they started, I mean, I mean, roaring laughing when they got to the uh, zombie in the room with him where he was getting the medication and it was clicking its teeth. The yeah. Audience, 
the audience started cracking up and I'm like, I don't think they intended this to be because the music's all serious and everything. And the audience is just chuckling. And I'm like, yeah, you know, and he's right. The walking dead, everybody sees that and goes, Ooh. And I just go, eh, I like Z nation better though. I know friends who hate Z nation. And I'm like, I like Z nation cause it's so ridiculous. That's what I want for my zombie. You know, Z nation what? is fun. I haven't it watched is. a lot of it, but uh, one of my best friends is really into the show and knows people that are, that work on the show. And it is so bizarre, but so good because it, it is the exact opposite of the walking dead. Yeah, it's a zombie yeah. series about zombies. It's not it's not a soap opera set against the zombie background, you know, and Walking Dead. Yeah, I'd see a, another George Romero film over watching the rest of the Walking Dead. I know blasphemous out there and people are like, <gasps> no, wow. seriously, I, I because, you know, I, get, I gave up on the Walking Dead after the first season. And yesterday, uh, while driving home from band practice, our bassist like basically told me what happened in seven seasons of the show. <laughs> and I'm like, eh, I don't. I could probably pick it up right now. He goes, Oh, you're missing all this character development. I said, But no, I don't no. care. Like, first no, of all, I, how long was the conversation? <laughs> half an hour. Half an hour for seven seasons of a show, or yeah. at least six seasons. Uh, that that's that's a thing right there. Is like, how much time do you spend talking about them at the farm? Because that was a bullshit. It's, it's second, <laughs> that second season. I'm like, that was like four issues in the comic, and they spent the entire season at the farmhouse just to get to the one thing that all the comic book fans knew it was going to get to. Yeah. You know, and I guess what what's you can, and you can see it in this season with the, oh, Negan's showing up. And I'm like, okay, that's great. But still, each season is, hey, we found a safe place to live. Let's start building society again. Oh, no, someone bad shows up, ruins the place. We got to go to another place. Same thing happens, only they kind of drop off a cast member or two every so often. I mean, that's, you know... <laughs> That, that's well, I mean, feels. at this point, it's it's almost like it's a snuff film because you're coming in with the <laughs> anticipation. They they leave off at the end of last season and give you the whole break to sit there and imagine who's going to get killed. And then not only do they kill those two people uh, in the first episode, which is a slight spoiler, but then they release footage of them killing other characters that it could have been instead. So you can just sit there and watch people that you have are supposed to love on the show just die all day. Yeah. Um, not my not my thing. Uh, my wife. And I had both abandoned it, I think, two seasons ago or two half seasons ago. And then she caught up on it and now she's into it again. Uh, she was pretty disturbed by the episode. She came walking into the bedroom. She's like, I had to I had to stop watching. I had to look away. I couldn't handle it. I'm like, well, that's great, I guess, that it gives you that visceral reaction. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that yeah. sometimes with Game of Thrones. I watch Game of Thrones and sometimes they do stuff on there and I'm like, hammered. I can't handle it. But Game of Thrones, I think traverses that and does other things too and i just had gotten to the point where walking dead wasn't giving me enough that wasn't that to to balance it out at the same time it's a hugely popular show uh so us talking shit about it isn't really going to hurt it uh a right. friend of ours <laughs> uh jackie hearn friend of the show uh we had her on elsner's recently she does a podcast called the walking drunk that is very popular Walking Dead podcast, and she kind of hate watches it at this point, but people still listen. I think that there's a lot of people who are on that that line now of just I keep watching because I have to keep watching. But but I keep watching Game of Thrones because I'm getting to an end point. The Walking Dead, I don't see an end point, and I don't care about the end point anymore. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that that's too bad because it started out as a as a very good premise for a show, has great actors has a lot of great filmmaking. What they do with the zombies, the way that they create different zombies, is terrific. It's very well thought out and, and utilized, but the show has just kind of hit that drag point, and it's dragged for so long that, so yeah, you bring in the next character who's going to kill everybody. Well, we had that with the governor already. Why do we need a Negan? Right. And, and, and then they're building up from what I sound like to heading to another even more bad guy. And that's what I mean. It, it, it's, it's kind of a rinse, wash, repeat season after a while to where, oh, they found a great place to live. Uh, they're feeling comfortable. Someone bad's going to show up and ruin things. And sure enough, there you go. You know, yeah. you're right. I mean, set up and everything that they did with it. For me, what kind of pulled me out is I was a big fan. Of, I, well, for a while, I was a big fan of the comics, and I read the first batch. In fact, my wife got me the compendium for um, the first like hundred 
issues or whatnot. And I read through that and it was great. And so they said to series, I'm like, all right, I'm watching the first couple episodes. I'm like, yeah, this is just like the comic. And then they kind of neutered a few scenes that were really powerful in the comic. And I'm like, you're a cable channel. You made these decisions, but here, you know, you know, like in the first season, I'll ruin it a little bit. Uh, Carl, uh, <laughs> there's a major confrontation where he ends up killing someone, uh, a major character within the first season. And in the TV show, they changed it slightly to where they waited till that guy turned into a zombie before that he he does, you know, he takes him out. And in the comic, he didn't what he, <laughs> he yeah. just, you know, and I'm like, that adds just a little bit by making him this. You take just a little bit of the impact away. And then later on too, how, uh, you know, what happens to Rick's wife was a lot more impactful in the comic than it was in the show. And I don't know why they did that, because at that point, you're like, that's what it would need. So that's why I think they did the whole Negan thing now with the people and and the hangar and how they why they went so visceral is because they're trying, I think, to bring back that edge that they lost. In yeah, all honesty, and, and people are saying people are complaining and saying that they want it removed from uh, cable TV, which is ridiculous. I'm, I'm not for censoring it. I'm just I. I don't, don't watch, watch it anymore. It. <laughs> yeah, it's right. real easy to change a channel. They give us little devices <laughs> right in our hands and do it. You can do it with your cell phone on a lot of TVs. Uh, it's not difficult. Just stop it. Just put it away. <laughs> you, you know what type of show it is. And in all honesty, I can't see why you would want kids to watch it anyway because they're not going to get like three quarters of the themes going on in the show. You know, it, it's just like all of us. We're all horror fans, but it doesn't mean we watch every type of horror. There's some horror out there that that's great. Some people love it. I can't watch it just because I don't enjoy that type of horror. I, I don't want them to stop making it. I'm not going to say, oh, you shouldn't make this film like this. They want to make that. Go ahead. You can choose not to watch it, though. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as far as showing it to kids, which I thought was really hilarious, like we have to protect the children. Like you have the ability to protect your children if you find this offensive. And then there's the other sect of people who might play this for their kids as a fucking training manual because someday the zombie apocalypse <laughs> is going to happen. You're going to need to pick up that fucking knife and I don't want to stand behind you and say, look at the flowers. No, fuck you, kid. You're going to hold your own or I'm going to bury you in the backyard. <laughs> wow. Okay, then. George Romero got squeezed out by Walking Dead. Yeah, oh, holy we're shit. At full, we're at full saturation of zombies at this yeah. point anyway, so I feel like if there's one person who deserves to make any goddamn zombie movie that they want to, it's George Romero. So it's disappointing to see that he's getting this kind of reaction, but I kind of feel like that he shouldn't... Nobody should be standing in his way of making a movie because he's no. got a he's got a built-in fan base. He's like a, a Kevin Smith. His movies may not make a lot of money, but they have the real solid fan base. So let him do what he does. You know, stick to a budget that seems realistic for what he needs to do, but let him make his movie the way that he wants to because there's always going to pe be people who want to buy that. Look look at how many people saw Texas, uh, saw, uh, uh, Texas Ch uh, Chainsaw Massacre 3D. How many of the... The movie cost like... What was it? Like $10 million to make, if that. And it made practically all of its budget back opening weekend. Yeah. Give George Romero, could you imagine? Give him $10 million to make a zombie film. You're going to get all his fans and horror fans in the seats for the weekend, make your money back, and there's no loss, and he gets to make another film. That's yeah, why studios love horror films so much. And it'll because, hit DVD, and it'll hit Netflix, and it will make even more money yeah. in the long run. And we continue to feed a master of the genre, uh, uh, the reason why we have this genre to a, a heavy degree. Mm -hmm. Fucking <laughs> Robert Kirkman should pay for George Romero to make a movie. There you go. Yeah, uh, if you're listening, Robert, make that after we, you know, slammed your show. Yeah, sorry, your show's <laughs> <laughs> Um Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D had a twenty million dollar budget, but they oh, made sweet. ten million uh, two hundred thousand at North America box office only on opening weekend. So it made half its money back the opening weekend, but ended up making forty seven point two million total. Well, there you go. You made so, a you know <laughs> that's why I, I did an article a while back about why studios make horror movies even if they those horror movies suck because they're cheap. They get newer yeah. actors that don't cost much. Mm -hmm. It and it makes its money back. 
Yeah. And, I mean, we've talked about how many actors started out in horror movies. Johnny Depp's oh, yeah. first movie was Nightmare on Elm Street. Aniston, Leprechaun. Yep. yep. You know, even like, I think it was, was it Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks was in a, a one. He was in the, the Dungeons and Dragons one. Mazes yep. and Monsters. Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, uh, I think Tom Selleck was even in one. Uh, oh, I'm looking this up. Daughters of Satan, I think it was. Or or one of the popular actors was in a, in a I think it's Daughters of Satan. <laughs> um, I've never heard of this movie, but oh, I forgot. But yeah, a number. Oh, yeah, it was Tom Selleck and Daughters of Satan. Yep. Yeah, you know, I mean, it. Uh, so a lot of actors have cut their teeth on B horror films mm-hmm. because that's they're looking for work. You know, because put... my life, I thought I was in a Daughter of Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I got a little soapbox. It's just that <laughs> I, I I really enjoy B horror films, and I hate seeing people rip on them because I'm like. That's where a lot of actors and actresses that you love nowadays cut their teeth is is there. Right. And, and to be fair, we rip on everything here, you know, yeah. whether we oh, like okay. it or not. We're yeah. the character's <laughs> shit. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's good, great, or terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk shit about it, and Matt's going to masturbate to it. <laughs> In the and bait zone. You guys, like, fill three more minutes. I'm not quite done yet. <laughs> No. no. Three minutes is, is two times in a nap. You... <laughs> I didn't say how many times I was going to be doing it. I just said I'm not done. Um, the next news story we have is the uh, there's a disturbingly beautiful, quote unquote, tribute to H.R. Geiger's nightmarish work. Um, it appears that someone has made a book uh, that has a 415 by 20 inch pages full of the art of H.R. Geiger. Holy crap. Yeah, it's it's a monograph is what it's called, and it's $900. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, this is not your, your coffee table book that you're going to sit there and then accidentally, you know, put your drink on. Uh, but it is a tribute to, I mean, we we all know Geiger from his work in the horror films between Alien and Aliens, the Xenomorph creations and um, Species. But his artwork traverses that to a certain degree. But it's always got that just gothic horror kind of feel to it. It's it's just brilliant. And and Geiger's one of those people that I've always looked up to and and admired his stuff. And this is one of those things that yeah, if I if I had an extra kidney, uh, <laughs> Matt wakes up in a bathtub one time and covered in ice, then whoa, uh, hey, I would whoa, probably whoa, whoa. At that just point, go- it's just an extra hole, Matt. You you would love it. You'd make it. <laughs> just, go like to, fish. just go to any foreign country, according to horror films, and you'll lose a kidney. So there you go. That's a really yeah. valid point, actually. You know, In Canada would just fill it with donuts. <laughs> I would prefer it to be filled with poutine. And you get a very nice apologetic note with it. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry we- about your kidney, man. <laughs> Sorry about your kidney. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, so there's a $900 book if you okay. want. Okay, mm. he has some really cool shit, but I don't know if I want to spend $900 on a 400 page book of pictures. I, I think anything that brings gear to the to a new audience is is worth it. But that's that's an expense. I'll wait for the paperback. <laughs> yeah, right. Holy shit! Is there a Kindle version? I'll take the Kindle version. Most of this stuff black and white. Cliff's notes. We got Cliff's notes. Only part of the pictures are in the Cliff's notes. <laughs> Here's where you pee yourself. It's like watching cable porn. And it's just all squiggled out. <laughs> Scarier than a nine hundred dollar four hundred page book is um, Burger King had a they they dressed one of their stores in a Halloween costume. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's just <laughs> wow. Well, there's the restaurant in uh, Rigo Park, New York. Basically, put a big ghost sheet over their sign, and it just was spray painted with McDonald's. Yeah, <laughs> they had a golden arch over the eyes. Yep, <laughs> it's awesome. I like how the eye yeah. openings though. You can see that it says Burger King behind it. Yep. Yep. And then they changed their sign to say "Boo." Just kidding. We're still flame grilling our flame grilling our burgers. Happy Halloween. That that's pretty cool that a restaurant they the manager let them do that and then they you know they have a sense of humor about it because yeah we used to have that I used to work at McDonald's in my college days and uh, here in Point there was a Burger King right across the street well one day that Burger King caught fire 
Whoops. And so we got a lot of their customers because the fire was was raging over in the Burger King. So we started joking about making Whoppers. We could make Whoppers here. We got mayo. We got Burger <laughs> <laughs> Just flame grill them over the flames of Burger King. Yeah, there you go. That's what we were talking about. We just cooked the meat over the ashes of Burger King. <laughs> I mean, I think this is really cool, but I, I think that it, it's just a tribute to the best disguise that Burger King has ever pulled off, which is making its food look edible. <laughs> I don't know. Their their king mascot is pretty damn scary. Their yes. king mascot is one of the scariest things I've ever seen. <laughs> it's, it's like it's, they sit, looked at the original Hamburglar and said, huh, that worked out well for kids with McDonald's. Let's do something that's going to make them shit the fucking walls. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was I saw some meme. I gotta figure out where the hell it was, but it was like uh, the the Burger King guy, and it said like Jared's in jail. Oh Something yeah. Something else. Yeah. I just need Wendy's sex tape. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Jared's in jail. More uh, McDonald's scary. Yeah. I just need a Wendy's sex tape. <laughs> it's just oh, like so oh, that's cool. wrong, man. Eh, could be worse. Could be Corey nude. <laughs> I, I will put my hair up in little pigtails for you and, and act out the Wendy sex tape. Oh, boy. Wendy. <laughs> Do a little dance, play Goodbye Horses. Goodbye Horses. Vivid Video presents Wendy's sex tape. <laughs> Enjoy a big and juicy. Oh. Get all four, four of her meat patties. Dave Thomas is baconating in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> I like the baconator, although it made my heart hurt after I ate it. <laughs> I like Dave Thomas. He was a great guy, actually. <laughs> Fucking Dave Thomas. Ah, um, yeah, I was upset that Burger King did this instead of making another Black Whopper because I had a fun time shitting green last year. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why I don't drink the Mountain Dew game fuel anymore. <laughs> I was gonna say, oh, yeah. you shit green eating one of those black whoppers, and you can just put it into a cup and say it's a McDonald's shamrock shake. There oh. you go. I'm just trying to. I, I mostly eat Taco Bell at this point. <laughs> it's just proof of how much I hate my insides. Um, Taco oh, no, you love your insides. Though. You just want to see them more. <laughs> I want to see. I love my insides so much. I'd like to see them more often. That habanero quesarita, man. There you go. Did you eat one? Oh yeah. Is it good? Yeah, it's really good. Is it like actually spicy or is it like oh, yeah, fast no, food it, spicy? It's, it's spicy. It it sticks around for a while. So, yeah. And then your ass is on fire, so you know it's good. It, it sticks around a long time. <laughs> I feel like uh, you just described every trip to Taco Bell I've ever taken. <laughs> <laughs> Which has not, not kept me from going back. <laughs> yeah, so there's not a lot that stops me from going to Taco Bell. No. Well, because it's cheap. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's good, though. I think it's it good. Is. I am... Um, I got. I was getting a lot of the big boxes because I was trying to win a PlayStation VR. Yep, uh, unsuccessfully, obviously, because I'm fucking. I think it. they lie. <laughs> I, I saw a guy on Reddit who claims that he won like a PlayStation and a VR and something else, and uh, they lie. I. That's quite possible. They they just have that auto response. You put the code in, and the guys in there <laughs> fail. <laughs> the fuckers. I, no I, one I just, wins. Every time I see a contest like that, I just want to do the Laszlo from Real Genius and just like figure out how many <laughs> fucking cards I have to print out to mail in. It's just that would be awesome with the the handwriting machine and yeah, the whole nine yards. <laughs> um, I, that's gonna that's gonna do it for the news. Unless you want to make fun of Burger King, excuse me, some more. <laughs> you can if you want. They're serving hot dogs now. <laughs> Their hot dogs are not good. No, yes. they aren't. They're I've horrible. They're, they're horrible. I also had the mac and Cheetos. Ooh. Well, I have a, I've got a soft spot for weird deep fried things. So Cheeto dusted macaroni formed noodle shapes right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had the Cheeto chicken fries, though, and that's probably a good thing. But it probably smells better because I walked into the Burger King when they started doing the, the Cheeto mac and cheese and the aroma was just enough to put me back out. But I wound up buying them anyways because it was like that. They just showed up. You got to get them. So I got to go back and took them up to Santa Rosa and wound up feeding them a bunch of them to the to the teenager because like he was the only one who still has hope and we want to ruin that. Before we <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> you are a terrible person, apparently. <laughs> you still have a good outlook on life. Here, eat this. Yeah. <laughs> this will break you. Uh, speaking of things that broke me, let's talk about this movie. Oh, The Serpent in a Rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or subtitled, Bill Pullman gets fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good old Bill Pullman. I was really excited when I started it and saw Bill Pullman was in it. I tried to do as little research as possible about this movie. Not on purpose. I'm just lazy. like every week. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need to know that. <laughs> um, I I personally really enjoy like the whole voodoo shit. So mm-hmm. I was really excited when I got that that was the the concept of the movie. Um, the movie could have been a lot worse, in my opinion, but. Um, I believe someone better equipped to recap the movie that's not me should do it. <laughs> well, I think we know how he feels about the movie already. <laughs> I, I didn't Just, hate it. Bill Pullman playing the anthropologist going to Haiti after he hears rumors about a drug used by black magic practitioners to turn people into zombies. It is based off of real uh, medical research Uh there, there, this was actually done at one time, but he goes it down to Haiti and he does all kinds of creepy stuff starts uh, to happen to him and, uh, and some nasty torture things happen to him uh, and he falls for a girl. It, it has a feel similar to Angel Heart, if anyone's ever watched Angel Heart, um, but I dig this film quite a bit. I think it's underrated. I know, I know uh, some people really don't like it, but for me, I think it's really cool. Uh, Wes Craven... Uh, a lot of people forget that he actually made this <laughs> film in 88, but and I think Bill Pullman uh, puts in one of his better performances in here, but uh, yeah, it's basically a voodoo movie with Bill Pullman and uh, a drug that makes people like zombie-like. And then gives you the option of actually turning them into real zombies right. by capturing their souls. Yes. Uh, there is the supernatural element at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was strange. Like, it, it danced on this weird line of, like, trying to be realistic and then being supernatural. and It, it goes from being a, this is about a place where voodoo rituals exist and using the science of saying why it can happen to suddenly, uh, this is when I knew it was a Wes Craven movie because the ending gets together and starts to become very Freddy Krueger. Yeah, uh, yeah, very like we got to defeat the bad guy. Magic shit starts happening. Souls start popping out and shit. Uh, here's my fucking totem, like I'm straight out of Power Rangers. Uh, <laughs> I halfway expected Pill Pullman to do it's morphin time and pull out a Schwartz ring and just <laughs> like it was really a bizarre ending on a film that did, it just seemed to kind of fall apart uh, towards the end. Like all the people in the the little village started uprising and overthrowing the cops, even though the the cops had automatic machine weapons, uh, and all the people are out there in front of them dancing and smiling, and then they start throwing fruit and shit, yeah. and the cops go down, yeah, and just get well, murdered. And I'm like, you didn't fire one fucking shot. Well, I guess it's because everybody there is not white, but well, they actually did film it during political and civil turmoil in Haiti. Uh, in fact, they, uh, according to trivia, they uh, had to relocate to Dominican Republic because the Haitian officials said they couldn't guarantee the production safety because <laughs> it really oh, was, wow. yeah. it was, it was actually in turmoil back then while they were filming in Haiti. And uh, so, do you think that made them write that part into the ending? Uh, that part in the ending, well, I. F- well, it it really features. I, I the impression that I get from this is Wes Craven actually trying to feature the zombie culture and put a different spin on it because it's just so negative, you know. And so you got good versus evil voodoo in here and that. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that added to it the real life strife going on. I think help add to the script that he wrote, you know, to feature that. And also that added the el- extra element of danger in here because not only do you have the voodoo creepy stuff, but you have a fact that a country could just blow up and, you know, he could just end up on the machete, <laughs> you know, at any point during it. So having it on in a culture where there's so much turmoil, I think just added that a little extra level of, of danger, you know, and, and the fact that he stood out in Haiti uh, quite a bit because you couldn't pick a more Caucasian actor than Bill Pullman at the time, I think, 
for that role. Uh, but yeah, I think I think that's part of it that helped influence it. Uh, but you know, for me, I I I got a kick out of it. It does take that weird turn for supernatural ending. But again, if you know it's Wes Craven, you're like, there it is. <laughs> you're yeah, like, expect it. I was waiting for it. <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, I, I think that strife and stuff in Haiti actually did have part of the uh, influence on his script. So, but, yeah. So uh, the motivations of the the bad guy in this are a little weird to me because he he kind of comes in like he you see him when the first person at the beginning gets turned into uh, essentially a zombie. Right. Uh, he's at the funeral for that guy, and then he shows up at the restaurant they're eating at. Uh, Bill Pullman sees him and then he like starts tapping on his glass and fucks up the rhythm of the band and it causes one of the people to become possessed and try to kill one of the other dancers uh, which is also weird but you gotta have a you gotta have a good solid back section for your band is what I'm saying uh, Matt should be able to relate to that <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> If, if, if your rhythm's off then it's gonna wreck the whole fucking thing uh, new CD yeah. coming out from Toronto Lifeguard very soon uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow alright <laughs> But so and and then he he gets he keeps trying to get Bill Pullman to leave the country and Bill Pullman, a uh, stupid white guy, doesn't do it, uh, even though they kill his somebody kills the guy who flies the chopper at the beginning. Uh, well, that, no, yes. that was in a different country because he was in right. South America at that time. So that wasn't in the same country. He was in South America exploring something different. That was a different mission. But but that's my point is we talked a little bit at the beginning of Matt waking up on a tub of ice, yes. and 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 we said well that happens in any other country that you go to, uh, he goes to the first country he gets fucked up he has dreams about uh, wrestling around with the jaguar which is a euphemism, uh, he probably doesn't hate much, <laughs> and then he his his chopper pilot gets killed and he has to wander through the woods chasing the imaginary jaguar jaguar which is still a euphemism. Uh, he gets back home, and then they're like, oh, we're going to send you to Haiti now to go find out about fucking zombies and shit. Don't worry, there's probably a scientific explanation. He goes there, shit starts going wrong, and then someone hammers a spike through his scrotum. Dickhead doesn't leave. I thought it was no. dick tip. No, no, it was it's, no it's, it's through his scrotum. They make it a point in the dialogue to make sure that they... Oh, I must have missed you, that. You know that uh, they didn't actually put it through... Uh, the tip that it, it was just through the scrotum. Yeah, well, there's, there's, a, there's just suspension of disbelief, and then there's uh, nail through the dick. That, I'm really, <laughs> really glad we got to the bottom of this. Thanks, guys. Yeah, well, I think that was just showing his his. It makes you wonder why the hell wouldn't he leave? But it shows you how motivated he is to get this powder. You know, I think that's what they were trying to go for is to show the fact that this guy was not going to be denied, and in fact, having gone through all this shit, he's not going to leave empty-handed. <laughs> you know? But then he does. He goes. He, he's like, "Fuck it, I'm getting on the he, plane. I'm going." Well, they and, they and, kind of escort him. He kind of has no choice. But. Yeah. But then Christoph shows up on the plane, which is a very different time when you could just randomly get on a plane, sit down, <laughs> hand somebody a vial of white powder, steal their watch, get off the plane. I mean, maybe it's not a different well, time in Haiti. I don't know. Uh, he, was part, he was part of the crew, though. So you know, and this is '85. So you know, different times. Yeah, but, it was it was very different times. But so Kristoff gives him the powder, and then Bill Pullman goes home. But then the dude fucks with him anyways, like possesses yes. the wife of of the guy who sent him there in the first place to attack Bill Pullman. And Bill Pullman's like, "Well, this bitch is crazy. I'm going back to Haiti again." I, I just, <laughs> well, no, he's going no back point. to Haiti for the woman. Because yes. he wanted this woman. It's Dang the love women. motivation. You know? Didn't ask her to come with him in the first place. Just like, nope. Well, well she, he didn't have a choice because they just took him right to the plane. She couldn't come on the plane with him because they wouldn't let her. It so. was it was just a very strange thing because the guy tries to send him off, then coaxes him back. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, his book. You're not safe anywhere. It's like, well, why did I send you away if I'm just going to continue to fuck with you? And why didn't I just send her with you? Because. Oh, it's okay if she stays here. Oh no, we're gonna kill her. We're we're just gonna kill her. And and Pullman goes back with no plan. He gets off the plane, gets grabbed by what he thinks are cops, and is surprised. Like, hey, I'm an American. I'm American. No one gives a shit that you're an American. Uh, fuck you anyway. Why are you here? Did you bring any coke? Did you, did you bring anything that we we like? Uh, T-shirts, something you know? Failed sports team. 
just <laughs> and and he just gets dragged into a car and it's like oh wait this is my friend who then five minutes later is coughing up a scorpion dead so yeah, like everything, fuck. Went, everything went to shit really quick while he wasn't there mm. so to go back and just like well I'll see what the fuck happens no dude you know what's gonna happen you got a nail through your scrotum yeah but he was Nothing still better thinking, than that he was still thinking with the same head though when he was going back because he wanted mm. her. And, yeah. you know, e- even more so than the voodoo guy messing with him, uh, it it's, you know, more of she, um, well, they kind of mention it in there as well that he was upset, though it's it's mentioned briefly. I, I totally uh, agree that the motivation of the villain is not clearly defined because they just mentioned it in a toss off comment, but he was actually upset that he took the powder is what it was. That and, makes sense. And uh, the only reason I noticed that this time is because I was watching, I just watched it before the sh- podcasting, and I watch it every year because I, I really enjoy this film. But uh, it was something I didn't notice before because I always wondered why did he really want to still screw with him. But he makes mention of you took something from me, and I realized it was the powder because he was using the zombie powder for his enemies and, and causing you know whoever he wanted to die to die. Uh, and basically Bill Pullman took his his secret powder and brought it to you know the masses and he didn't like that because he was batshit crazy anyway uh so and I I didn't notice that I've watched it many times and I didn't notice it till now that yeah that's that's what I believe his true motivation was was fucking with him was because he took the powder he he knew he had the powder that's well, why he that's, you know go ahead that, Sorry. that's the thing that I problem with too is that he somehow possesses the wife of mm-hmm. uh uh, Paul Gilfoy's character, uh, Cassidy. Yep. He, he somehow gets possession of her, and he's he's fucking with Pullman's brain. Now, Pullman had just said earlier that the effects of the powder wore off after 12 hours or something, is what they had determined in their experiments. And so there's, there's someone who is feeding him the soup, and I was imagining that they were going to show that the, the guy who works for, right. for Cassidy and his wife is part of them and he's he's infected the meal with these things to make this happen but they don't show any of that so it's just weird that hey you're across the world but i'm gonna possess this woman who's sitting in front of you and cause her to come at your face with a knife and uh i mean you're already fucked up so i would have accepted bill pullman still having visions Mm -hmm. but the part of her getting possessed was weird to me yeah that that part was uh, was odd a little out of place and looking more up on it i think i know why uh, you know there's some trouble with the narrative is the fact that this was initially a three-hour film of course it was oh holy shit because it, it's Wes craven and but apparently with test audiences uh and that they had they cut it down to 98 minutes so it makes you wonder what that three-hour cut or even a two and a half hour cut might be because, like you said, too, it, it seems like it jumps fairly quick. And I have a feeling in the lost footage or what ended up hitting the cutting room floor was probably explanation or setup that was cut in lieu of just having batshit crazy things happen at the end of it. Hmm. You know, um, but yeah, it, it, it's not explained too much. I thought maybe they were going to go with the waiter because he did have an accent. The waiter putting something in the soup as well. Uh, for that, but you know, overall, as far as creepy movies go, I, I, I that's part of the reason why I enjoy it, though, is just because um, I think it's a really creepy movie that doesn't rely on your jump scares to to you know creep you out, and the fact that voodoo is pretty damn scary, <laughs> so, uh, personally. But well, it's, uh, yeah, voodoo always seems to be like rooted in reality to an extent, <laughs> and I think that's kind of what does it. Um, one of my favorite video games of all times is the first gabriel knight and it's all about voodoo in new orleans and um it's just it's super well done and that's something about it you know um there's a couple of years ago we went to universal's uh, halloween horror nights and they had like a whole voodoo section and it was like all bayou looking shit and it was just so fucking cool because of i don't know i don't know what it is about voodoo that it just always does it for me well, and, and at this time, too, you did have a few other voodoo films as well, popular, wide release. I mean, like I mentioned before, Angel Heart. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Angel Heart, but that movie's... Mm-hmm. You think this film, you had probably that one. That story is really uh, whacked. 
in all honesty. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and it, it's done in the same vein as this. You know, the, the guy kind of caught up in the the voodoo culture and that. And that had Lisa Bonet in it. In, uh, yeah, I was going to say, oh, I remember it, Lisa Bonet being I, in that one. I will say that we're talking uh, 87 when that came out. And I was... <clears throat> in my my full teen swing so the reason i went to see that is because i had heard lisa bonet got naked in it so <laughs> <laughs> that is that was my oh, full man. motivation for seeing angel heart totally um, <laughs> <fair>. <laughs> wow. and it, it made a long run on cable too they played it like constantly on like hbo and showtime and that back then uh as well and it's it's just a weird movie i don't know how really good it is but i like this one better out of the voodoo films but um you know i just think this one though has a lot to it even with its crazy ending uh to it and it makes me wonder what that longer cut would have looked like though well i also wonder because originally this film was supposed to be done um with peter weir was going to direct it mm -hmm. and mel gibson was going to star in it uh that was that's how the got the the right. rights of the book and so that right there sounds like a very different movie mm -hmm. yeah i would suspect if that was the case you wouldn't have had any soul thing at the end if, <laughs> if... Yeah, probably not <laughs> i mean they had done the you're living dangerously together i think if i remember yeah right. yeah and i, do and I so. can see that as them teaming up and like okay this will be the the follow-up this is what they'll bring to it next mm -hmm. and uh, things just went in a very different direction <laughs> I I remember seeing the trailer for this, so the trailer for this was pretty doggone creepy. Um, yeah, I remember the commercials for it, and they couldn't show him. There's the part in the coffin where it's filling up with blood, and yeah. they couldn't show the blood being red, so they had to make it green in the commercials. Yeah, it was it was really weird. Which was an impressive scene to have your actor, your main actor, do that scene because it's like <laughs> it's pouring up around him, and I'm like, wow, that's going to be like a one take. Like, we're, we're just doing this once. Otherwise, uh, he may drown. Uh, so. <laughs> but I, I, I like Bill, Bill Pullman in this. And again, I think this is one of his better films. Um, I like Pullman in most things. I, I, yeah, I can't say here. that I've ever had a bad experience. It, I've seen him in movies that maybe weren't the best, but he was very good in. He, he, he always really puts himself in the roles, you know, I mean. And and I totally forgot again that it it's Michael Go, uh, you know the butler. I, I forgot that it's him in this film as well. And you know, Alfred it's, from it's, the Alfred. Batman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Paul Guilfoyle from CSI, who I was hey. trying to place the whole time. I'm like, who is this blonde, beautiful <laughs> man? And I'm like, oh wait, it's the it's the fat bald guy cop from CSI. <laughs> it is younger years, so yeah. a, little, a few pounds lighter. Um, yeah, you don't recognize him right away either. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, wait, who? So, but and then uh, Zex Moke is is Darjan Petrad, who's the the villain in this, and Paul Winfield. There are some really good people in this. I mean, they're character actors that you you see them and you're like, I know him from something. I know him probably from several somethings. And you don't remember exactly what, but they are they're well they're yeah. well to do actors. They it's it's quality people in this. I just mm -hmm. I think that it's it's almost like it's two movies. Mm -hmm. uh, the first half of the movie is very much referential to probably what the book is about, which is not a fiction book. And then the, the latter part of the movie is all the supernatural stuff taken from a, a more Clyde Barker, Nightmare on Elm Street kind of feel. And that to me is, is if it had been all that or if it had been all the first thing, in either of those cases, I probably would have liked it more. Uh, but sure. trying to make the two fit together, it just didn't click mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, it does change the tone. The tone does change like that abruptly. So, uh, but you're right. I love the characters in it as well. I mean, Brent Jennings as Louis Mozart. It's such a great character. The guy who makes the powder, yeah. Paul Winfield. Yeah, there's a lot of great characters in here uh, with a diverse cast. You got to look at it too, even especially for the '80s. You know, I know where it's set, but if you people talk about diversity in a film, this has a pretty diverse cast. Yeah, because you, you were know? saying Angel Heart. Angel Heart was Mickey Rourke and um, Robert De Niro. It, it yeah. was still it was a lot of you know Caucasian people yes. in the roles. <laughs> there, there's still uh, a lot of Caucasian people in Angel Heart, but in in this one, you know it. it it stands out a little bit. You you kind of notice that the diversity in the cast, and I like that. You know, at least it it uh, 
you don't get that a lot, especially in those late 80 films. So, uh, but yeah, you know, I know a lot of people have issues. I, I still think, especially for late 80s horror, trying something different other than your slasher film, I think it uh, it took a chance and, and yeah, I just enjoy it. <laughs> but I know Matt probably has different feelings. He's been kind of quiet about the whole thing. <laughs> I, I Like I said, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. And sure, for, it was better than I expected it to be, mm-hmm. based on the name and just seeing it. Uh, just there wasn't like a ton to the story, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Like it was really cut and dry, and you got what you got. And then at the end, it took this weird turn, and <laughs> <clears throat> it was a very straightforward, um, straightforward horror movie with a, with a voodoo story. And I, I'm not I, upset that I watched it. Well, that's there good. were scenes where. Um, where Bill Pullman's character is being led around by Duchamp, uh, the played by Kathy Tyson, who is just stunning in this. Um, yes. But, but she's showing him different places. There, there's a scene where they go to one of the caverns and mm-hmm. all the people are running into the water and it's just beautiful. There, there is an exploration of some of the space around them that you get to see. It's not a lot of that, but when it happens, it does kind of pull you in a little bit more into the, the world and, and what Haiti is like. Um, that probably didn't have a lot of perception in Hollywood. We probably weren't seeing a lot of this kind of area uh, in films at that point, and probably still aren't now. Mm. But it was there was some moments where I was like, okay, this is being filmed strictly to show that this place is mm-hmm. not just the voodoo shit that we're trying to feed you right now for the the fictitious <laughs> story. There is more to it than that, and I thought that was good to include. Uh, yeah, that, don't go ahead, man. No, I, sorry, I'm it's just scrolling through facebook uh have either <laughs> of you seen bloody disgusting yesterday at twelve twenty four? no uh a buddy of mine who was on this podcast kyle uh did a Huey herman monster halloween costume and bloody disgusting posted the picture yesterday i just saw it oh that's, oh, that's cool. awesome yeah sorry awesome. yeah all right carry on with whatever the hell we're here to do <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I will agree. Uh, I like the parts where it, it shows you more than just the voodoo stuff of Haiti. And, you know, it's what's funny is that you don't expect that in a film like this. Here we're getting this stuff about voodoos and stuff, and all of a sudden we're learning about the culture of Haiti. That's not voodoo. It's, you know, religion and these beautiful places that are around Haiti, and you're just like, they're trying to do something a little bit more, which makes me wonder what the longer cut was like because i bet you it explores that even more is there a way to you know like do they ever release the longer cut no are no. they ever going to i doubt they will ever because uh, this film is kind not obscure but uh it's, it's out there it's it's out there but it's got a, a big uh more of a cult following but um you know and it's still again here's a horror film that cost seven million to make and it grossed 19.5 million uh, oh wow <laughs> you know so uh mainly probably because it had Wes craven's name on it um that's possible but, but it, I mean, it's cre- was it pretty much his follow-up to nightmare on elm street uh kind of well this was 88 so elm street was this was 84? 80 yeah elm street uh was 84 so this is after this is after dream dream master came out the same year so this is when he was kind of at its peak because they were into the dream story, mm-hmm. the dream arc in Nightmare on Elm Street. So Wes's name was was pretty big at this point. So I think that's part of the draw, you know. And even that on the title, they say from the director of Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, oh. it's after Deadly Friend. So going off of stuff that he actually directed, Deadly Friend and the oh, Hills Evans Part Two, sure. mm-hmm. uh, we're we're both between them. But you said this was filmed in what did you say it was filmed in 85? You mentioned 85 earlier. Well, it was set it was set in 85. Uh but it was they came out in 88. So um but yeah, it was set during 85 during the the Haitian uh what was actually going on in in Haiti, the the revolution and it it was still in turmoil even when they were filming later on. <laughs> so and he, and he went right from this to shocker and I could see mm-hmm. that ending Again, it feels very much like Shocker, which was very derivative of Nightmare on Elm Street too. It, it yeah, it seems like maybe that's that's just all he was doing for endings for a while. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. 
<laughs> I mean, some of those, some of those guys, especially the horror guys, they get into that, you know, what works or whatnot, and we'll just do a variation of this, you know. Well, you uh, stick with what works. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, it's still, if it's still made money, hell, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, strike while the iron's hot, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. It's not a horrible movie. I I really enjoy it. Um. I think it deserves a watch, at least for Bill Pullman, though, because he actually gets, you don't get to see him that often, but at the end, he gets a really badass scene at the end with the, <laughs> with the nail, and he gets yes. his revenge, and he just sells the hell out of that scene. I just love that because Bill's like, this is the only time ever I ever get to be a badass, so I'm going to make the most of it, you know, and I just, I really enjoy him in that final scene where he straps the guy to the chair and gets the nail out and i'm just like wow bill pullman actually is being a badass <laughs> so. i think at that point in time bill pullman was still like because he was lone star lone star was yeah. a badass mm -hmm. it, it, when he was the president of the united states in independence day he was still you know he for most of the movie he was a little bit meek but he comes across as a badass during the speech when it's important sure mm -hmm. uh i think that bill pullman was capable it wasn't until we saw him in what was it uh, sleepless in seattle where he yeah. was the unrequited, like, I, I love you, uh, Meg. And she's like, yeah, but I'm going to meet this stranger up on the top of the building and see how that goes instead. Uh, <laughs> that's that's when we kind of, like, push <laughs> Bill to the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, you know, he became less of a badass while you were sleeping. <laughs> wow. Well, and, and but at the end, too, it actually showed a little bit change in his character who was kind of meek in the beginning you know i mean he was you know running from everything <laughs> just about it. <laughs> he was running a lot but he was also like oh yeah you want me to drink this thing right before i go sure yeah. stop for the road <laughs> boom and then it's like stands up falls right over that was, great. <laughs> that was a great fall too i liked it that was so straight out of indiana jones though because yep. <laughs> i just like run into the plane and and like i expected his friend who was sitting next to him like i go first <laughs> You know, it just like there was so many moments in this where like this could have been so much cooler if they just went full just full, rip off everything else. Full Indiana Jones. There you go. They could have made this an Indiana Jones film. There you go. <laughs> I mean they sort of did with They did, uh, yeah. Yeah, the second one. And they, it, 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 I, I thought it was interesting with Serpent of the Rainbow too, is that he get uh, a noir feel. You know, you get the voice <laughs> over in that, you know. And so, which worked out so well for Blade Runner and the opening and closing of Gremlins, as we talked about here recently. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man! Uh, Sometimes you gotta try something new, I guess. The art of voiceover. There you go. Ooh. I liked how you said that too. <laughs> Very suave sounding. I want Mark to do my voiceover from here on out. <laughs> yeah. Mark, Mark, can you voice over my life, please? <laughs> And Matt, then why Matt, do you keep touching yourself? <laughs> and then Matt entered the room and locked the door. <laughs> <laughs> he entered the bait zone. <laughs> My bait laboratory. <laughs> That's weird because it makes it sound like you're holding specimens. I don't like that at all. <laughs> Well, when I'm done, I'm holding a specimen. <laughs> it's my giant <laughs> penis. Kleenex, I'm too lazy to throw away. <laughs> and after he left the bait zone, he looked for a tissue, and the phone rang, and he didn't know what to do. Do I pick <laughs> up the phone with my hand and specimen, or do I let it go to voicemail? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, and this is when the show takes a weird turn. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm going to go to Big Lights later and buy a squeegee. Never be sorry. <laughs> Matt, Matt would be the only one who wakes up with after the zombie powder wears off in the coffin and just, oh, okay. Yeah. <sighs> I don't have enough room to really rub one out, so <laughs> make me what I got. <laughs> hey, the spider is fuzzy. <laughs> oh. Bunch of old socks wandering around the room like zombies. Just... <laughs> All the all the the voodoo priest would be standing around waiting for me to scream, and all they hear is boom, 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 boom. Like, what the fuck is going on? Now I got that scene where the guy throws a powder in Bill Pullman's face. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> um, I do want to talk real fast about Bill Pullman's funny zombie walk, though, because that yes. was like straight up John yeah. Cleese for a moment there. They they have him wandering through, and he's he's I couldn't tell if he was possessed or he's just like trying to recover from being dead. He was, but he's, he was, he was going through, and his leg is just kicking up a little too off. And I'm like. You, you probably could have done that better because that's that's the part where everybody laughs at, at Brad Pitt's zombie. That's yes. yeah, that was off. 
<laughs> yeah, that was his funny walk. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's go ahead and rate this, I guess. Since Corey just wants to talk about funny zombie walks. I do. Uh, we're going to rate this. this thriller? Oh, boy. We're going to rate this on uh, three three categories on a zero to five scale. We're going to start off with rewatchability. Mark, after you. <laughs> well, I'll be a, a little bit biased on it, but I'll, I'll say four out of five for me. I watch it about once a year, uh, usually in October. Um, you know, it's 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 fun for me but i can see i see a lot of people you know it might not be that high for them but for me i i watch it once a year because it's it's fun and especially with some of the modern horror that we have that relies solely on jump scares Mm -hmm. it's 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 nice to see a film that's trying to at least do something different for the most part yeah Corey. uh see i'm the opposite i unlike matt i don't have a love of of voodoo at all and i remember when this movie came out i just did everything i could to avoid watching it it just never <laughs> seemed interesting it was better than what i probably thought it was going to be but that's still not saying a lot for, for what it was <laughs> uh i i will go as high as a two out of respect for mark oh, don't have oh. don't forget my respect no go ahead if you hated no, it and, that's and cool because like you said <laughs> the people in it are all good uh they're great actors uh, they there's things in this that I think are good. I think it's just it's two different movies. Sure. And either one of them, if they had been completed on their own, would have been a better film. Yeah, whatever. Um, I'm gonna say two and a half. I mean, I, I didn't like I said I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. I'm glad I watched it. Um, but I don't know if I'd really go out of my way to see it again. Mm-hmm. But there might come a time where I get the itch and I go back to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking about this conversation makes me want to watch it again. Uh, next, we got story zero to five. Mark, that you know what? I'll actually say three point five. Even though I love the film, I fully recognize the uh, the issue with the story and how it's kind of two separate films. And it makes me wish uh, there was a longer cut out there because I would have liked to see the full plan of what they had. Yeah, Corey, uh, I'm actually going to go three on the story. I, I think that. The idea is solid. I think it was a, it was a lot to try to work with, and yeah, if if there was a longer cut, I I might watch it. That might make me um, feel a little bit more interested in what they could do with it. But if the longer cut is just a lot more scenes of people dance around doing like the really <laughs> weird version of Disney's <laughs> Parade of Lights, uh, like at the beginning, then then I don't know. But mm-hmm. Uh, all right. I also will give it a three. It was a cool story, I guess. I mean, it's it's not like a brand new story, but it was a good interpretation of mm-hmm. the classic voodoo priestess, priest dust zombie type shit. So, um, lastly, we have scariness zero to five mark. For me, it's five. I I this film creeps the hell out of me maybe it's because it's voodoo and it's it's in you know set most of it's set realistically to the last that third act where it starts to get supernatural and kind of crazy but for most of it i mean especially the part where they're they're putting the guys in the coffin and they're still alive i mean that just that i the idea of of that just really creeps me out and so most of the film there's just that creepy vibe Mm -hmm. uh and for me i like that and again uh very few jump scares but yet it's still creepy it's still a really creepy film you know i mean yeah yeah the dead bride scene and and there's just a lot of great scary scenes in this film that you just you're just like for me anyway but no uh cory the dead bride is actually pretty cool i had forgotten about that until you mentioned it i i'm gonna i'm gonna go three just because the ending is in all ways like it it defeats what was scary about the beginning Sure, but the beginning stuff, all the the more the less the less um, Hollywood type of supernatural version of the voodoo stuff is great. Mm-hmm. It is really good. Uh, so for me, it, it meets a halfway point between those two. Uh, I will give it a three. I like the reality of it, but towards the end, it kind of lost me. So. <laughs> The Power Ranger angle. I understand. The Power Ranger. <laughs> um, that's one way to look at it. Awesome. Well, uh, you can contact us by leaving us a voice mode 805 328 3966. 
You can email us at pot at gncast.com. You can leave us a voicemail. Whoops, I already said that. You can leave us a message on the website. Uh, apparently, I'm in rough shape today. Uh, simply put, we want to hear from you. Let us know what your favorite part is, your least favorite part. There's a squirrel on my deck showing me his butthole right now. That's, that's my favorite part. That's a true story. <laughs> true story. That's why I got sidetracked because I'm like, what the fuck is that? Um, <laughs> let me know if you want to hear more about the squirrel uh, his, the squirrel's butthole. I, I just love the it. idea that a squirrel comes up to the house and just presents himself to you like that. <laughs> You like, you would be surprised how many times like we're doing these because the, the window like is just to the left of my main computer monitor, and the squirrels will just like lay on the deck rail and just stare at me. Like, I'm, not all, I'm not surprised at all. I'm not surprised that in your neighborhood, in in the strangeness that you've described of your neighborhood, all the squirrels are like, I think I could get Matt. I, yeah. I think I could. Yeah. I, I could land that one. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna look at it? Don't feed me as nuts. Oh, yeah. oh. Uh, please follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Podcast of Terror, and you can subscribe to this podcast via <laughs> iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, any of your favorite podcatchers. You can leave us feedback on whichever one you like. All subscription options and links can be found at gncast.com slash subscribe. Finally, you can find us on Facebook under the Galactic Network. Mark, where can all of the nice people find you? Uh, specialmarkproductions.com is pretty much the uh, central location and from there you can get to my YouTube site uh, the We Live, Film, uh, we Live Entertainment site and the podcast as well uh, and on the uh, Twitters if you care to follow I throw some really crazy selfies that I started and I don't know why I keep doing them but I do with every uh, new release I do I stand in front of a movie poster and do a really odd smile and I get really weird looks from the people getting their tickets but I don't care uh, it's the <laughs> eyes it's what you do with your eyes at <laughs> time. Like, one and, of these times it's going to go too far man he's going to go too far <laughs> and look like Glenn on the season opener of Walking Dead I'm just <laughs> Uh, uh, but that, spoiler. that's at yeah. a, a Twitter at, at Movie Maniac 3D, all lowercase at Movie Maniac 3D. I'm on the Twits. So awesome. Corey? Uh, you can go to donaskcomics.com and find all the comics that I help post and publish. Awesome. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Matt the Lifeguard. Mark, once again, thanks for spending time on this not beautiful, kind of cold <laughs> Sunday afternoon. Unless you like squirrel butt. Unless Unless you like squirrel. Squirrel butt. Well, if you like squirrel butt, next time you, you can just come over to my house and we can do this since you live like an hour away. But The smell of squirrel butt in the air. <laughs> just squirrel ass in the air. <laughs> uh, all right. Agreed. Now, now, now. Oh, I just got Tom Jones and a squirrel. And... Yep. Yep. I'm going to leave you on that one. Mark, thanks again. Uh, but, thanks again for listening to the podcast. Darren, we'll catch you guys next time. Awesome.